Okay, everybody, um, we're starting up, so please take your seats. Oh. Okay, so we're continuing our um, presentations on uh, uh, management, and uh, in this case, um, Jeremy's going to be talking about um, sim simulation modeling in uh, fisheries. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, a little bit of a disclaimer on this one. Uh, about in the cold light of day last week, when I came to actually put this together, I looked at that title and went, good God, why did I pick that? Um, you know, that is a real ambitious kind of area to be uh, talking on in a, in a 15 to 20 minute slot. So basically, I um, put a qualifier on here and I'll, I'll call it a personal view because this is largely a recount of, of my um, experience. It's yeah. like no one agrees with you, right? Yeah, that's a good disclaimer, I think. So you can't, no, that's be brilliant. Disagree with me or agree with me. The worst thing you can do is not do anything. So disagreement is fine. So um, I will launch into this. Uh, it is a scene setting talk. So it's sort of coming in the middle of the session, which is probably not less than ideal because a lot of these things have been kind of discussed, but I, I'm putting, I'll put it into, into some sort of framework for us to sort of hold some ideas around. So um, simulation modeling is important for stock assessment. Really? Good. In a number of areas of my experience. So um, looking at stock assessment model functionality and testing, just simple model testing using simulation in some degree is, is obviously important in that space. Um, and another area we use it is generating data to do survey designs, building better trawl surveys. We've used it a lot to design mark recapture programs and CPU analysis, you simulated data is really useful to understand some of the biases that we've got on that hideous data set. Uh, the other main area, which is which you guys have all been talking about, of course, is management strategy evaluation. Now, I kind of recognize there are two flavors of this. Um, there's the classical one that what we've all been discussing today, uh, the, the feedback loop system, operating model, estimator model, performance measures, um, decision harvest rules providing management advice on to turn of management strategies. Okay, that's what I term as classical, but there's another one that I have been playing with, which I think does fall under the space, which is really what I call fancy yield per recruit type projection modeling. And we've got a lot of issues in particular the snapper fishery though, that I'm working on, that there's a, a lot of impetus around the trawl fisheries to change gear selectivity, um, to avoid small baby fish and catch big ones, which is all fine and dandy, but there's some a lot of implications in terms of incidental mortality as to what that might mean in terms of yield terms of the, of, of the stock. And it really depends how, what your assumptions on natural uh, incidental mortality are. So we've done projection type models using quite our know, complicated snapper models um, to look at um, what if scenarios around optimum yield to advise managers. On, on, on things they need to con consider. So I think that's a management strategy evaluation as well. And I think the other thing we shouldn't lose sight of that stock projections are essentially simulation analysis. So there's a number of areas simulation is really fundamentally important to what we do and understanding what we do and actually conveying the information to managers to make decisions. Um, so I've come up with a few questions here. Um, most stock assessment models can be configured to function as simulators, no brainer there. Um, most of the current main stock, stock assessment software packages have that functionality built in. So it's just an obvious thing, a requirement that the next generation will have to have some level of simulation capability in it. But I guess the questions are, well, what have I done? Why has it gone blank? Peer review. Is that what it is? <laughs> Okay, I think this is picked up where I should. Um, 
what additional super, uh, simulation capabilities do we need to build into the next generation software packages? That's you know, the level of simulation capability. And given that the next generation of stock assessment packages are likely to have expanded simulation capability, will there still be a need for independent simulators? That, that, you know, that, that are we gonna come up with a one size fits all or do we still need to think about alternative uh, simulation uh, models? And what follows is some insights into the general, uh, into that I've gained from building simulating, um, simulation models. Um, I was responsible for building an agent-based simulator for our snapper fishery, which I'm terming an ABM. Uh, this one I wasn't involved with, but I've gleaned enough to know about why it was developed and some of its features over the years. Um, Niwa um, built a specific simulation package, as a lot of you have heard, called SPM. Um, and there is it's interesting to look at the rationale why we went down this track and why we didn't just use Castle or, or SS3 or something. Um, but I think it's kind of useful before I kind of get into that is to just um, have a little bit of a, again, my opinion view on um, how, what, what drives the level of complexity or what should drive the level of complexity we put into stock assessment simulations. And because MSC in terms of the classical MSC is pretty fundamental now. I think it's useful just to go over the components of that and the sources of error that sort of need to be in that to sort of set the scene of how we would design simulators to fit in with that construct. So I'll, I'll sort of tell you guys to suck eggs a little bit by talking about MSC and hopefully not offend anybody. Um, and why has it done that again? Okay. Uh, okay, so here we go. In my opinion, um, complexity, answer this question, what level of complexity we put in simulations and estimations is largely, I think in the first instance, is what are the management requirements? There's no point in building this fancy thing if the managers don't need it. There's no point in designing complex models if the management advice doesn't warrant it. So that really does drive everything, I think, fundamentally. The level of precision managers require to make the management decisions needed for the fishery. And another aspect of that is the nature of the management advice required. And I'm, I'm specifically referring to tactical advice and strategic advice. And uh, I mean, I guess you guys are aware of this, but uh, I mean, the, when we're talking about strategic uh, advice, we're talking about uh, developing objectives, the processes associated with developing management objectives and evaluating strategies that can achieve those objectives. When you're talking about a tactical kind of response, you're, you're saying you've already got the objectives and you've already got the, the, the process that you're going to use. You just want to optimize it and find the best way of doing it. So in our space, uh, fisheries single species assessment models are by and large, the estimator models are by and large tactical. When we talk about MSC, by definition, that's strategic. But the complexities around that type of advice affect uh, a number of the ways we, we structure everything. Okay, so um, and the second point is, is the power and the observational data to support the level of complexity we require for management. Well, that's a pretty obvious thing. Um, we, uh, sorry. So we, we in, the, in the issue of simulation, we've of course got the ability to play God and make up any level of complexity we like, but there's clearly some bounds on that, and, and it's largely how much power there is in the observation and all data to support the additional complexity, all the assumptions that we're meaning, make, wanting to make. And, that, and I guess I'm talking about how well we can condition the, um, the, the uh, simulation space. We, we, we can't wander too far above that, beyond that. If we do, we, meet, we lose um, management credibility pretty quickly, is what the point I'm trying to make there is. Um, okay, I'll just ignore the blank slides that keep appearing. Um, so simulation modeling, getting back to the point, is an integral part of classical MSC, and, there, and it is useful to consider the purpose and requirements of that uh, in terms of looking at how we might build simulators, um, particularly the next generation of, um, of those. So 
one of the key things that go into MSEs are the consideration of uncertainty. Um, and there's a really good paper, and I think it's, it's still pretty seminal, and, and, and we trot, I see it trotted out a, a lot, which is Francis and Schott in 1997. Now, they came up with a nice definitions for compartmentalizing uncertainty in, in the space we work in, in fisheries and modeling. Uh, and they came up with six. Um, in my opinion, there are at least five that basically should be explicitly or implicitly functionally in basically any MSC that we, we framework that we, we do. Um, now, what they list is um, first is what they call process uncertainty. Well, what, what actually you're interpreting that is, is random effects, basically, in the way they describe process uncertainty. So that, that level of uncertainty is, is, needs to be included. The next level is observational uncertainty. So the uncertainty around the data that, uh, that, that gets generated, and it includes sampling error, biases, but that's something fundamental to, to the simulation process. Oh, come on. Right, okay. And the next one is um, what I call model uncertainty. So the mismatch between the model and the real world. Uh, and, and how that might um, propagate uh, error or, or, or uh, uncertainty in the system. Um, estimation uncertainty, how well our estimator does to, to, to count it to, to provide, even though it's, it's got the right data, you might have the right perfect um, model compatibility between the observation, the operating model and estimator, there's still some issue on how well these models can perform. Um, and another one that, I think is often overlooked is implementation uncertainty, whether the management policies will be correctly implemented given that you've given them the advice. And as I said, all these things probably need to be considered when you're actually building one of these um, processes. And um, I'll just uh, put up for everybody who knows the sort of general modeling framework of, of an MSC. Now, when you look at it like this, this, this actually, six models that can be in there. Um, so you could, you could build component model comp um, for the system that, that are for six independent models or six models that need to communicate information to create the process, or models can do some of these functions. As a minimum in this, you've got to have two models. You've got to have an operating model side and an estimator side. So the minimum number for an MSC is, is two, but all those components need to be encapsulated in the number of models that you use in some way. And I've attempted to, and I'm welcome to welcome any criticism here, to sort of put in where you can see those highlights where some of those key areas of uncertainty, you would, you would introduce them or you'd need to think about where they would ha act at those sort of modeling levels or functional levels. Um, the next question, getting back to the topic here though, where do the next generation fit in? Well, quite, no brainer, they obviously fit in there. Um, but how much of the building of the next generation software do we need to consider their roles in the other parts of that, that process? And that's, that's just a question I'm throwing out um, to the group. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna talk about our experiences building an ABM simulator for um, our main Snapper stock. Uh, we term Snapper 1. Um, so it, uh, there's some fundamental uncertainties in our, our Snapper assessments for Snapper 1. Uh, just to give a picture of it, Snapper is a really long-lived sparrow, lives to 60 years maximum age. The main exploitable part of the fishery sits in the 5 to the 20 year age group. Um, we think we have three productivity units as part of what the Snapper 1 complex. Uh, they do seem to share or mix together in some way. Uh, and it is modeled and assessed as a spatially disaggregated Castle One age-based model, but there are some challenges that we've had around trying to build that model and assess it, hence the, the need to build the simulator. Um, some of the key uncertainties relate to the spatial structure assumptions of that assessment and the associated movement around it. Um, so we needed a simulator that was really capable of high degree of spatial disaggregation and implementation of, of movement dynamics to sort of test these assumptions. 
The other thing that we've got in this space is there's a high degree, regardless of movement, um, temporal change in things, growth changing over time, and we've got this annoying fishery that's changing its gear. Seed activity process, they're shifting the way they catch fish in terms of the types of gear they're using, but they're also moving around all over the place. So they are now moving out of one of the main stock areas to what, what was considered the highly depleted stock area, and that has big implications for management. You really need to understand movement dynamics to, under, to make sense of the exploitation at the spatial level. Um, future concerns, this is coming up, and more and more of us are facing this in terms of projections, what if. There's real concerns about how ocean warming and ocean acidification will affect this fisheries productivity. And we already have evidence that juvenile habitats been destroyed over the last millennia, I guess, so the last 100 years, exacerbated in the last 30 years where the loss of juvenile habitat is really being a problem uh, and a concern. So all these things affect um, productivity and all of them, I guess, relate propagate into being non-stationarity and, and the productivity, both currently what it is and what it will be in the future. Those sorts of things we want to understand by using simulation. Um, so we, you know, I basically provided the definition of what we're after um, because many of the uncertainties relate to length um, based processes. We've got tagging data in there and we temporal changes in growth. We really needed a fully age length integrated model to be the simulator. So that was one of the fundamental requirements. That's one thing Castle really doesn't sort of do um, exactly well. I mean, it makes an approximation like the other models do, but it's not, it's not actually got that capability. Um, we chose the ABM because, uh, and then the other th aspect was that it has uh, high spatial configurability. Now we chose the ABM over SPM because we um, really needed to have uh, the ability for the characteristics of the populations that moved around this highly complex space to retain the memory of where it was or the attributes it had before. Now, one of the problems that you've got with SPM and, and also in our main stock assessment models, which partition models, is when something moves into a new partition space, it takes on immediately, instantaneously, unless you've created a separate partition for it, that's in a new partition, the characteristics of that space. So if it's a fish that's come from a slow growing area, it has a, me it has a mean weight of X, as soon as it goes to a fast growing area, instantaneously, instantaneously in the model, assumes the, the higher rate. And the ABM approach leaves, lets you change the growth rate of the fish, but it also has to count the fact that when it came in there, it had some memory of what it was before. So that functionality we, we really liked um, and think we needed, and that's what we really liked about the ABM approach. Um, another advantage of the ABM is that they, um, yeah, I'll just move over that one. Ah. Yes, so the other advantage of the ABM was they're very powerful in terms of being able to account for a lot of spatial complexity. Um, the main limitations on the speed of running ABMs is not, is not so much the spatial complexity that you've got in there because the, the characteristics of the fish carry all that information. So the speed of the ABM is limited by the number of agents because you've, each time step you've got to loop, loop, loop through the state of each agent and also the number of time steps. So it's, it's limited by that aspect, not so much by the degree of spatial complexity you put into the, into the system. So there are there are advantages from that respect in terms of being able to bolt on or change spatial complexity um, a lot more easily than you can the spatial partition model. Um, there are also, the one thing we like is there's a significant uh, computational differences between the ABM coming up with its view of the world and the way CASA was working. And we think that's really fundamentally important that the, your operating model and your estimator have some you know, computational differences, even if they're producing the same result, um, that gives you a lot of insight into the, into the estimator uncertainty. So the ABM was certainly far removed from, from what Castle was doing in a number of respects. Um, so for so many reasons uh, for choosing the ABM, with true length, age integration, complex partition capability, past partition agent memory, 
and compu computational difference between Castle and the estimator. So that's why we kind of went down that track. Um, SPM, I'm, as I said, I'm less familiar with, but I can sort of provide, Matt can step in if I've got this wrong. Um, the reason for uh, the uh, SPM development was that it, um, they had a lot of spatial complexity in the Kamlar assessment of the Antarctic toothfish. Uh, and the SPM tool was built as a simulator to provide insight into that. It was not actually built to be as an MSE um, type operating model, though I'm not aware they might have since done that and it's certainly capable of that, but the impetus was more to understand some of the um, complex spatial assumptions that sat behind the toothless assessment because without it, what I understand is that um, you had different states of being in terms of the status of that stock depending on your assumption. So this tool was built to sort of provide insight and, and hone down the um, spatial assumptions and inform the model um, from, from the analysis it did. Um, like the ADMB model, SPM is highly configurable uh, and capable of very highly complex movement simulations and these are largely, as I understand, driven by preference functions. Now this tool is available in the public domain and I think reasonably well documented whereas the, our AD, ADM, ABM model is still in the kind of development phase, although um, people can have access to the code if they want to. Um, and I understand the SPM is both uh, length and age based. So uh, I'm getting to the end of this, thankfully. Um, I'll leave those questions up there because it's kind of useful for people maybe to have some discussion around that. I'm just gonna throw out my opinions again because the personal view thing. Um, so clearly some degree of space simulation capability is needed in the next generation models. Um, but my experience that the complexity requirements of the simulators is, can be very high relative to the estimators. And, there's some sort of decision needs to be made whether you really want to invest in that level of complexity when you basically the tools function is to be an estimation platform. So that's, that's the challenge you've got is how far down the rabbit hole you go in terms of complexity just for the sake of making a simulator. It might be a perfectly good estimator with the level of complexity you've got. So that's a challenge. Oh, come on. Um, I believe it is not desirable to use the same simulator operator model. I think this is a sort of mea culpa confession that went on in the last presentation about that. I mean, we, we as a minimum, I think we probably want to be using like Castle for a simulator, Castle 2 for a simulator to, to provide data for a, a, a SS4 assessment. But um, it's, it's likely that, that, that we want to use a different code base for our uh, simulator to our estimator. Um, I think that this also leads into a real good rationale for continually to develop parallel next generation packages. You can test them against each other. Um, you know, it's, it's a way of checking each other's maths and, and also I think some sort of synergies come out of that, that sort of approach. As long as you're kind of following the same frameworks you can share information and, and it will benefit the whole process in, in the long run. So I think, I think um, that is a real, real important thing to think about. And currently I see simulation modeling platforms, separate simulation modeling platforms as being necessary. I think it should be, there's a need for continued development of those. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Um, anyone have any questions? Andre? Two, two things. Uh, one, firstly, agree with the general sentiment. So uh, I think it was Jeremy who referred to the Australian simulation testing where we're trying to comp uh, do an MSC for uh, multi-species biological and technical, technical interactions. And so we got two operating models, one based on essentially a synthesis type structure and the other is based on Atlantis, which is not SPM, but is highly complicated, very different. So I think the concept of multiple simulators is great. No one is ever gonna fit 
Atlantis to actual data in my lifetime, but that may be pretty short anyway. Um, but I, one question I did have on the ABM, which I think is important, is conditioning, which is, uh, it's easy to create a simulation model for a species that perhaps doesn't exist in our universe and then SS doesn't work for it. That's not very helpful because we want to, we want to condition our operating models or simulation models on data as close as possible. One of the challenges of agent-based models and stuff is that fitting process. So with the danger is you create a universe that doesn't actually reflect the history of the fishery and, and what little you know. Um, and, and you can end up with quite misleading results. So uh, a, a comment on, on how did you condition the ABM so that uh, it's consistent with the data, but obviously is more complicated. Okay, okay. So where we're at with this is we haven't actually got to the next phase of, of actually using it as an MSC. So actually creating something that the estimator model doesn't know about. So but what we've done is a lot of extensive testing with the same, same exactly identically specified base population model. So what drives the ABM functionality is upper level, same as any other model. It's got specific growth parameters, same parameterization at the, at the population level. The ABM approach adds the stochasticity at the, around those parameters. So the first off test, smell test was, if we identically configure the ABM to Castle and, and give it the same catch history and everything else, same set of activity, everything identical, you should get the same result. Otherwise, you've got a problem. Even at the simple level, like the growth curve, like when you generate uh, the distribution of different growth vectors, which actually give you the, the length composition of the stock, you want the mean growth to be the BB parameters out. So we did extensive testing of that and that works. Uh, and that's documented in the father um, that's available. So if anybody wanna know about that and give it to me later, look at it later on. Uh, so we are happy that in the core structure, we can replicate a petition-based estimator. The next step is to start to say, okay, now what if we do something different, which is what you want in the estimation, in the simulation space. So it's not this spatial structure, it's another spatial structure. Um, and that's where, I guess it doesn't matter if it's an ABM or anything else, you need to, you can't stray too far beyond um, what, uh, what your credibility space is. Um, so that doesn't, that applies to the ABM as much as anything else. And that's where we're sort of moving into. But in terms of the core functionality of the tool, we're pretty happy that it can replicate in the, in the, in the base sense. Um, I, I would love to know if anybody does have any ideas on that uh, concept that Andre brings up though about when, when I create kind of an operating model, you know, I look for kind of characteristics that are similar to real data, but that's a, you know, eyeball. Okay. I think, I, I think that's, you know, those are patterns that we see in data, but obviously there's no optimization. So it's generally a subjective, um, configuration for it. <laughs> not a MSC meeting but um, you know there's th that, that standard of you know be best visual fit is is probably you know not unacceptable in many of the applications that if you looked at the output from your operating model it should look like the real assessment or something similar to it um, the whaling Commission which may or may not exist in a few years time uh, we essentially always fit our operating models to the actual data. Um, we may have a lot more process error and, and model structure, but essentially we still manage to fit the data. I'm looking at Biaki, he knows this because he was the poor sod who had to do it. Um, so uh, in, in that context, you know, there, there's sort of a, a, it is a thick red line. Uh, but once you start having biology that, and particularly trends that don't look like reality, then you're not very case specific and, you shouldn't use the results in a case specific sense. And it looks like um, Rich has got a comment too. Uh, SVT might have done this. No, I'm going to talk about someone else for a change, which would be good for everybody. Uh, no, I think that's a really interesting point. And I think some of the likelihood free methods that have been used in the ABC synthetic likelihood space where you have 
observed trends and things like that, but in an ABM sense, it's very hard how you think you'd create a differentiable likelihood. It's not going to happen, I don't think. But those have some potential. And let you put it on a, a you know, an inferential footing. Like you can stand, begin to talk sensibly out of probabilities. It's, it's computationally hard, but it's possible. I'm, I'm, I think I'm just interested in what you said before, Andre, about you've, you've worked with simulation or NEC processes which have taken observational data from a, a LANIS simulator. I mean, I have my views on Alanis, and I think everybody in this room has got a different view on Alanis, but the main issue is in the fishery space, we're still very close to that tactical edge. Uh, well, what, what I'm getting at is that the Alanis has got a lot of supposition, a lot of like, this relates to this, the whole ecosystem's in this sort of thing. And you, at the end of the day, you've got to convince a manager or yourselves that, that what you've actually got from that system isn't just some you know, emergent effect that's, that's not real. Um, you know, how do you justify that complexity in the simulation is what I'm kind of asking. <laughs> well, our, our approach is, I mean, Atlantis is not something you fit the data, uh, but we've basically used the sort of pattern oriented fitting approach with Atlantis, which is there's a whole bu bunch of stuff going on inside there, but if the CPUE trains don't match the observed CPUE trains at least reasonably, um, uh, you know, then you fail. Uh, there's a paper by uh, Isaac Kaplan and Kristen Marshall. So I was part of a review of an Atlantis model, and we came up with essentially what you have to pass to be able to use an Atlantis model, even strategically. And they had so much pain, they actually wrote a paper on the topic, uh, <laughs> which is a little weird. Uh, but basically, they, you know, they, what, what are the minimum standards that an Atlantis model passes the sort of best visual uh, assessment? Um, and, and that model didn't, but that's a different issue. Um, but yeah, it's a different standard. Clearly, you're not going to check all 1,500 parameters, or at least I'm not. Maybe Jim is. Were you on that review? I think you... No, Martin was. Sorry. I get confused between Martin and Jim occasionally. Okay. Uh, anyway, on that... I think that's me, <laughs> yeah, on that note, we, we should finish because we're running out of time. Thank you.